Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I wish to thank Bebleo just to, to the opportunity just to, to show some of the data that we are getting on the biological effects of nanoplastic uh, following ingestion. Uh, uh, in this in this lecture, uh, and perhaps following the, the, the content of the previous lecture, we, we will talk about plastics, microplastics, and nanoplastics as emergent plumes. Uh, a simple definition of the plastics is a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic organic compounds that are malleable, and so can be molded into solid objects. Uh, one of the most important characteristics is that they have multiple applications and low cost of production. This means that they are producing at high levels. And then as a consequence of the high production levels, we have high amount of plastic in the environment. And then uh, in fact, plastics or macroplastics or nanoplastic are considered as emerging pop contaminants. But there is a, a remain open one question and this type of pollution by plastic, it supposes one uh, health for humans or not. Uh, I wish just to try to, to show some data explaining uh, the, the relevance of, of plastic as an environmental pollutant at a worldwide level. And then uh, this is an, a figure from uh, the Plastic Europe, is the, the organization that uh, joined all the uh, plastic producers in Europe. And then it's showing the, the, the different type of, of, uh, of, of, of use of plastics and which is the, the, the amount that we are producing in Europe. It's, uh, it's about uh, 52 million of tons per year. And the most interesting is just to show that about 40% of, of the plastic that we are producing is using for packaging. This means only one use plastic. This means that it's used and this is go directly as a waste. Uh, if the, the problem is big in Europe, uh, it, it, this uh, this uh, figure can show that the, the, the production in Europe is just less than 20 percent of, 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 the, of, of the, the production over the world. This means that the, the level that we are producing of plastic every year it's around 350 million of tons per year. Then it's just to show which is the, 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 the level of the problem. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, we have a first conclusion is that plastic is more omni omnipresent in all the com in all parts or niches of the world. And then it, we are plastic dependent. Our life and our economy is plastic dependent. And we are uh, entering in one new plastic year and then uh, if we are more or less shocking or not, uh, we are becoming a homoplasticus. This means if uh, uh, we need just to ask ourselves what will be our life if plastic disappears in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if we have plastic in the environment, uh, we can try to recycle. But the res uh, at present, the recycle capacity is significantly lower than the production use this means that most of the plastic that we are produced finally end as a waste in the environment. Some part of this waste, it can be controlled, mm -hmm. but this is only a small part of the plastic that we are producing or using. Most of the plastic finish in the, in the sea, as uh, it can see show here, the large amount of plastic floating, floating in the sea in the coastal areas. If it disappears, problems with this plastic in the coastal areas, the most relevant is just to remember that exists what is called plastic islands in the oceans. And then this, the, the, they are inside of these oceanic gears and then retain large amount of plastic. This size is more or less in a scale. And then they look, if you compare like Australia, for example, this island has more or less the same size, or if I compare with Spain, obviously it's larger. The open question that we have is, uh, there is negative health effects associated with the production use of plastic. This is the, the, the question. When we're talking about plastic, we need just to, to divide uh, the problem of the plastic in the environment in two parts. One 
it will be correspond to the, what we say the visible part of the problem, which is the, the plastic that we have shown in the previous uh, uh, pictures. And then is what it's usually is called macroplastic. Mm -hmm. Because there is a non-visible non part that is uh, constituted by a smaller size of these macroplastic that are called microplastic or nanoplastic, depend if they have a micro or nano range. Uh, the, this figure of Ivor is, is very interesting because you know that uh, the most part of the iceberg is behind the level of the water. And uh, this is the, what I want to show that the most part of the plastic uh, is not uh, the plastic that we saw, so, but the, the, the plastic who is more or less non visible, which are microplastic and nanoplastic, are the real challenge that we have. The micro nanoplastics uh, results from the uh, degradations following different mechanisms of the, the macroplastics. And it, this, this is a, a continuous process. This means we are uh, uh, getting uh, macroplastics in the environment and continuously they are degrading and, uh, to transform in micro and nanoplastics. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we know about the biological effects of the macro and nanoplastics, and uh, because the, the the first alarm about the effects of of, of plastic waste appears in the in the sea, a large amount of studies has been done using marine organisms, mm -hmm. but we don't know nothing practically about which is the risk of hu in humans. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have a tool with the human biomonitoring studies that is. Uh, it permits just to analyze what is happening in individuals who are exposed to something, this, in this case, to, to micro nanoplastic. But we have a problem. Is then at present, with that is not tools enough powerful to measure the levels of exposure that we have exposed. And then if we don't be, are able just to measure the levels of exposure, we can evaluate the risk because the risk is the, the relationship that there is in the, in the levels of exposure that are able to produce a particular. If we have a, a big problem because we, have, we can use analysis of humans exposed directly, you need just to select uh, for alternatives. This means we need just to look for a new models and biomarkers just to try to, to get data enough sound just to be used uh, for for the human risk evaluation. Since ingestion is considered the main route of exposure, mm -hmm. uh, we present here two of the different models that we are using to evaluate the interaction of different micro-nanoplastics with the intestinal barrier. In particular, we are using two models. One is one uh, in vitro model of intestinal barrier that uh, is constituted by, by different uh, is a human cell lines with a co-culture of different human cell lines. And in addition, we are also a very simple in vivo model, who is the intestine of the larvae of Drosophila. We will show something about that. Here in the left, uh, there is our, our model that is growing in this insert mm -hmm. of the plastic, who is in the, 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 the in one well of the, or, or, or the one place of the well. And then where we put different type of cells, we are using three different human cells, CACO2 who are enterocyte, HT29 who are global cells, and RAFI who are lymphocytes or are from human origin. Then uh, we mix different proportions of CACO2 and goblet cells uh, and, and in, inside of the insert, and we put in the, in the bottom uh, the human lymphocytes, the human, uh, the, the, the Rahi B uh, as a, a lymphocytes are able to transform some of the enterocyte in M seal. If you look, this is our in vitro model, and you see here this scheme of how the human intestine looks, we can see that our model is very, very similar to what occurs in humans. Most of the cells are enterocyte, like here, enterocyte. Some that, uh, some there are a spread, a spread some goblet cells. We have some goblet cells who are producing the mucus. We have the mucus in the in the surface of enterocyte, and in addition, we have some uh, M cells. We have some M cells 
are that are uh, cells involved in the in the immunological response. This, using this model, we can detect. Uh, then we can put in the surface some micro nanoplastic, uh, and then obviously we can detect if the the the, the, the nanoplastic it's in is uh, captured by the mucus. Uh, if it is able just to cross, if it is able to internalize, and is able just to translocate uh, through this barrier. This means that different effects that we can look are internalization, genotoxicity, or oxidative damage. This means some types of lesions in the, in the cells, changes in the expression of different types of genes involved in different pathways, uh, and just to detect uh, how is the integrity or permeability of the barrier affected by the, the plastic exposure, and if the plastic is able to translocate or not. These are different types of effects that our model to permit to evaluate. Obviously, if we have our model, we need just to use one, one model of, of, of nanoplastic. In this case, we are using nanopolystyrene. Nanopolystyrene is considered more or less one uh, a standard of the, of the nanoplastic or the microplastic because it's, it's commercially available. There are different types of size. We have versions who are fluorescent, and then uh, we have also uh, different changes in the in the surface of this type of the plastic. Okay, using our model, the first thing that we that we can see is that when we expose one model with only two cells or with three cells, mm -hmm. then to to different increasing concentrations of of nanopolystyrene, no effect on the cells it can be detected. This means the first consequence that this nano nanopolystyrene seems not be uh, toxic, at least in the in our cell model. Uh, we can try just to detect the integrity of the intestinal barrier using this measure, which is the transepithelial resistance, and as you can see, uh, no effects that is in the in the in the in the resistance of the, or the integrity of the barrier. This means obviously. The exposure to nanopolystyrene doesn't affect the, the integrity of the, of the intestinal barrier. Uh, uh, and similar, it is, of course, when we are looking, uh, me measuring the flux of Lucifer yellow, that Lucifer yellow can only cross the barrier if the, the tight junctions that there are between, between the cells are more or less uh, no, no perfect, and then it can cross. If the barrier is uh, it's without change, Lucifer yellow can cross like show here, unlike how it shows. Then this means the integrity is preserved. It's, uh, it is surprising this type of effect huh, doesn't correlate with the ability of uh, nanopolystyrene just to close the barrier. This is uh, 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 the confocal images of the of lateral view of the, of the barrier. Mm -hmm. This is the top. And this is the bottom, and we have seen obviously a lot of, of uh, nanopolystyrene in the surface, but some of these are able just to cross the barrier into internalize into the cells. And in addition, internalize, we can uh, see uh, some uh, na uh, nanopolystyrene in the bottom, and also remember that in the in the in the in the bottom of the of the insert uh, there was RGB cells that we are able to identify the presence of nanopolystyrene inside of the Rehan barrier. This means our barrier accumulates large amount of nanoplastic and nanoplastic nanopolystyrene is able just to cross uh, and to pass to the basilar, basilar area. Uh, we are looking for potential effects on the cells and we are looking the 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 the, the reduction of breaks on DNA damage or oxidative DNA damage, and then as you can see, not effect observed at all. Mm -hmm. The conclusion from our results using the polystyrene and the, our in vitro model of intestinal barrier is that high levels of polystyrene uptake are observed in the in vitro model of the intestinal barrier. And in addition, and it's very relevant. Uh, polystyrene is able to translocate through the barrier and move to the basal lateral side of the transwell as a model of blood 
compartment in humans. Mm -hmm. uh, translocated polystyrene can internalize into the Rahib cells as a model of human blood cells. Uh, nevertheless, polystyrene doesn't not seem to affect neither the structure nor function of our model of intestinal barrier. And in addition, polystyrene doesn't not induce linear breaks or oxidative linear damage. Uh, for this reason, in, in addition to this in vitro model, we have tried just to use an in vivo model just to know what is happening in vivo. And then for, for this type of a study, we're using one, one model who is uh, a very well known in biology, Drosophila. This is one adult of Drosophila, but we are not using uh, the adults uh, because Drosophila as insect has a, a complete metamorphosis and a star, the adult put eggs eggs transforming the larvae, larvae became one pupa, inside of the pupa take, uh, take place the metamorphosis and the, the new adult appear. So we have next generation. Then the life of the, of the larvae is about five days and the larvae are very worse and then they are digging constantly the, 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 the food media. And then this is the model that we are using just to detect the, the effect of, uh, of polystyrene in the uh, intestinal cell. And this is, a, this is an, a scheme of one larvae. It, it's a very simple. The, it's the, a big intestine mm -hmm. uh, and the cuticula of the larvae. Mm -hmm. And then the larvae, it's, this means that the, the, the middle of the intestine is what we call a uh, mid uh, uh, Obviously, the intestine is covered by the mid gut cells. Mm -hmm. okay. And in between the intestine and the cuticula, there is the, the hemolymph, which looks like the blood in humans. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry. And inside of the hemolymph, uh, there are hemocytes who are the same, the cells that look like the, the lymphocytes in humans. Obviously, this, uh, this model. With are in, in one particular media, grow media, they are, the media is growing constantly through the intestine. If in the media we put uh, uh, micro nanoplastic, nanoplastics can, can obviously go to the mid abdomen and they have the possibility just to go inside of the, of the cells, intestinal cells, and able just to translocate to the emoline. Then uh, this is, is uh, one scheme perhaps more clear than if we have one, one part of the central, which is the midgut of the, of the drosophila. And then this is the, the, the lumen, where we have here our macro, uh, macro uh, or nanoplastics, uh, uh, that it can be in contact with some component of the, of the intestinal lumen. We have here the, 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 the barrier, the intestinal barrier, which is constituted by enterocytes and that are protected by the peritrophic membrane, hits like the, the mucus, um, the mucus in, in, in humans uh, have the, the best mem membrane which separate, which separate the, the intestine from the emolymph where we have the hemocyte. And then this means that in, in this um, type of model, we can uh, see theoretically effects of microbiota, uh, and damage on the cells, different types, the in induction of, of uh, reactive oxygen as, as species, and also DNA damage. This means that we can evaluate a wide set of effects. In, in our study, we have used polystyrene, but in contrast with the study with, with uh, in the in vitro model that we use only one, one size, 50 nanometers, in this case, we have tried just to evaluate the effect of the size. And then we have used uh, polystyrene of 15 nanometers, 200 nanometers, and 500 nanometers. There, here, there is a set of six uh, features that are re repeated uh, uh, for each one of the polystyrene that we are using, and try just to explain which is the journey of the uh, uh, nanopolystyrene uh, when he is going inside of the intestine of the, of the larvae. Here is just that we are able just to detect the, the presence of nanopolystyrene inside of the lumen of the cell. We can detect some type of interaction of 
nanopolystyrene with the retrophic membrane or with the bacteria who is in the, in the, in the lumen. Uh, we can just cross the, the, the presence of nanopolystyrene inside of the enterocyte. This is enterocyte. And here we have the microbili typical of the enterocyte. We can detect in different in different part of the of the of the cells of the, the cytoplasm of the cell the, pre the presence of uh, different uh, nanopolystyrene. And in addition, it what is more relevant. We can when we when we go to to the emolive, we are detecting the presence in the emolive of the single uh, particles of nanopolystyrene or aggregates of nanopolystyrene. This means that. Nanopolystyrene is able just to translocate through in vivo, through the bar intestinal barrier. And this, of course, when we have 50, when we have 200, and when we have 500. Uh, if the nanopolystyrene is in the, in the emolymph, uh, it can interact with emocyte, and we can try to detect effects on emocyte. This means we can detect the induction of oxidative stress. This is clearly significant, or we can detect the induction of damage on DNA that is significantly increased. And perhaps the most interesting of this data, in addition to the, the, the effect, is that the effect is size dependent. This means that a small size, size produces more effects than large size. And then it's a core for the oxidative stress and also a core for genotoxin. And perhaps in that last photo, the, the, the most interesting result that we can also observe is that digestion mm -hmm. or the pass of the plastic for the intestine is able to, to modulate some of the physical, the physical chemical characteristics of the, of the nanoplastic. In this case, we can detect, for example, that for the large size, 500 nanometer, uh, the, the, the polystyrene inside of the intestine reduced significantly its size. This is also observed for 200 and practically is not observed with the, the smaller size of 50 size. This means that if we can more or less conclude, uh, uh, taking or, or, or assuming up uh, all, the, all the results, then intestinal barriers are permeable to nanoplastic. And this, this is a, a very relevant because obviously if uh, close the barriers, they can spread over the body. And then uh, we have data just on the intestinal barrier, but the, the question is that what happened in another type of uh, the barriers, like for example, the, the lung. Uh, also, we can just uh, detect that ingestion can modulate some of the uh, characteristics of our, big, our micro nanoplastics. Right? then uh, we can more questions, which can be the effects on different gut components, or the most relevant is which is the effect on microbiota. Uh, the, another, another important point is that uh, if cross the barrier, the first, the first uh, mm, compartment the nanoplastic meat is the, the, the blood. This means in the, in the blood, the cells who are in the blood, it can be the first target once micronanoplastic turns okay. And we have detected different types of potential Sahar hazards in the exposure cells. We can detect the, the oxidative stress, the genotoxicity, changes in the, in the gene expression of different, different types of genes, changes in the immunological response, and we are now evaluating the potential ability to cell transfer, transformation effects that are linked to the cancer induction. Okay, uh, thank you for the, the attendance. And this is uh, the, my address is someone that's interested to. Thank you.